Well, hello there and welcome. Uh, we're going to talk for a few minutes about uh, some of the benign entities uh, that uh, pop up in the stomach and that we encounter in our GI surgical pathology service. Uh, we'll focus on the benign entities this time. We'll come back and visit uh, malignancies at another uh, stage and probably also do some focused uh, case sharing uh, as we go along uh, further along as well. Um, our key objectives today are to help you to be able to differentiate the common patterns of gastritis and understand uh, some of the treatment implications associated with those, recognize some of the important precursor lesions and their syndrome associations, and most of all, we want to have some fun. So uh, let's begin uh, and talk about what, what constitutes normal. Well, as in so many places in the GI tract, it depends on where you are and what you're looking at. Uh, so uh, biopsies taken from the esophagogastric junction should have some uh, measure of uh, uh, squamous cells, some uh, glandular cardiac type mucosa, and they may normally have some uh, mild degree of inflammation as well. Uh, in contrast, what we see in the uh, gastric body will usually uh, have a different composition. Uh, chief and parietal cells will be present in the uh, mucosa. Uh, with the typical foveolar lining. And as we look at high magnification, uh, you know, we'll see very few or, or little um, uh, expansion of the, the lumen of these glands and virtually no inflammation in between the glands. Uh, moving further down, well, in the antrum, the story is a little different. And we see only uh, foveolar epithelium and the uh, uh, mucinous epithelium of the antrum without any evidence of chief or parietal cells in the normal sense. And note here that the ratio between the, the sort of superficial portion and the uh, um, uh, foveolar type epithelium uh, in the glandular component is uh, about uh, uh, one to three. The characteristic feature here, of course, is the uh, presence of occasional enterochromaffin cells, which uh, can be highlighted here as uh, occasional clear cells within the uh, uh, anterolglandular uh, structures. And notice that there's very minimal, again, very minimal inflammation in this uh, epithelium or in the mucosa, and we don't see much uh, other uh, changes here. Um, as we move a little bit further, uh, we should expect to see, begin to see uh, some Brunner's type glands uh, migrating uh, from within the mucosa down into the uh, submucosal space, and we can expect to begin to see some goblet cells as are highlighted here uh, on this higher magnification view. Now, there are some nonspecific things that we can encounter uh, in uh, ulcerations and so forth that we should not misinterpret as either organisms or uh, malignancy and those sorts of things, um, as well as the accompanying hyperplasias. So uh, with ulcer debris, you can get a lot of smudge, a lot of uh, sort of uh, tumor necrosis type of stuff, but this is actually normal tumor, normal uh, tissue necrosis that's happening here, and the acid's altering it, and you get this sort of smudged appearance. Uh, likewise, adjacent to these uh, ulcerations, you can see quite pronounced uh, foveolar hyperplasia, uh, as noted here with this uh, pr pr pronounced elongation of the uh, foveolar uh, component. Uh, that's very typical for a regenerative type of physician. Another uh, change that uh, you need to recognize is the uh, pseudoneoplastic uh, reactive changes that can occur with uh, granulation tissue type vessels. And these can sometimes produce a very uh, bizarre nuclei, pronounced uh, nucleomegaly, uh, mega nucleoli, and a very inflamed appearance and sort of streaming appearance. Uh, along this um, tissue. Um, and because these vessels are so poorly organized, they oftentimes don't look like vessels, uh, may not even stain completely like vessels, but we'll just have this sort of uh, atypical smudged appearance. Um, these are generally to be regarded as uh, benign. There are a number of things that we should ignore, uh, but that sometimes people get caught up on. Uh, so when I hear someone say, well, there's focal acute gastritis, I think, yeah, you may be making too much because these are all things that uh, you make that as a diagnosis on your report and you're going to get a phone call. What do I do with this? What does this mean? Does this mean the patient has helicobacter? Does this mean there's lymphoma? What is, what's going on here? 
So these little foci of acute gastritis, really pretty insignificant. Uh, gastric cardia with a few scattered lymphocytes in the lamina propria, hardly should, needs to be mentioned. A lymphoid aggregate uh, in the gastric body, again, not terribly significant. A little bit of minimal inflammation in the uh, antrum, uh, again, not something that is gonna trigger treatment or uh, follow-up or anything of that sort. Uh, so in the absence of other features or other compelling reasons, these are things you sort of just gloss over, you turn down your, your sensitivity scope and uh, don't uh, bother commenting on. Okay, there's that little rant. Uh, let's go on and talk about a couple of little ditzels that occasionally uh, get biopsied because they show up as a little mass um, and uh, uh, we're surprised to see them. These are little, little heterotopias. So here's a nice example of pancreatic heterotopia, which even includes a little pancreatic duct, as you can see here, bulging out into the gastric uh, uh, mucosa. Here's a gastric gland heterotopia. Um, where you see uh, gastric type uh, mucosal glands deep in the uh, mucosa. Uh, and this sometimes is called uh, you know, gastritica, gastritis cystica profunda, uh, essentially because there's cystic change and you've got deep uh, gastric tissue. Um, more commonly, these uh, heterotopias of gastric type are seen elsewhere in the, in the small bowel, uh, but uh, we see them in the stomach and occasionally in the esophageal gastric junction area as well. Uh, vascular uh, lesions uh, can be present in the uh, stomach um, because it's uh, close enough to the uh, overlap zones so that when we get portal hypertension, we can sometimes see pretty pronounced uh, vascular uh, congestion, maybe some capillary hyperplasia type changes uh, in the submucosa, much like we would see in stasis dermatitis, for example. Uh, this is sort of stasis gastritis uh, that's going on here. And rarely, uh, we will see uh, ischemic type necrosis, uh, where for whatever reason, uh, the mucosa has this uh, very uh, uh, homogeneous eosinophilic appearance, uh, and is not terribly different from the uh, sort of uh, acute inflammatory and almost exudative appearance that we see with uh, ischemic enteritis elsewhere in the small bowel or more commonly in the colon. Another vascular lesion that is uh, uh, kind of interesting to uh, see, uh, but can be underdetected by uh, uh, casual observers is uh, so-called gastric antral vascular ectasia or GAVE, uh, also known as watermelon stomach because of these sort of alternating uh, uh, pale and uh, erythematous streaks that sort of orient towards the pylorus. Uh, what this corresponds to uh, is a vascular lesion that's most commonly seen in elderly women, uh, sometimes with anemia, uh, sometimes with some other systemic uh, uh, autoimmune disorder, like systemic sclerosis. And under the microscope, what do we see? Well, we see um, a little bit of smooth muscle streaking, uh, and we see a little bit of congestion here. And at low power, we should begin to focus on these capillaries here. We've highlighted them. We'll give you a high magnification view, and we can see here's the streaky smooth muscle. So it's sort of an indication of there being some sort of a gastropathy. Here we see the vascular ectasia, very superficial uh, in the uh, gastric mucosa. And if we look far enough, we should see these little uh, fibrin and, thr and uh, platelet thrombi uh, in some of these uh, vascular spaces. So it's a, a kind of fun lesion to detect. Um, uh, and uh, certainly helps to answer the question of why the patient may be anemic and uh, provide some uh, guidance for management. Well, of course, the stomach uh, is the first receptacle of all the medications that our modern society has invented. Uh, so as I say, pills pass through here, and they don't do so um, without effect. So let's look at some of the medication-related changes uh, that we can see. Uh, most commonly, uh, proton pump inhibitors, certainly one of the most uh, frequently used uh, medications for uh, dyspepsia and so forth, uh, can produce this uh, uh, glandular ectasia or dilatation and sort of frilly uh, vacuolated change to the epithelium in the uh, excuse me, gastric fundic and body type mucosa. Uh, 
Uh, and that is uh, quite characteristic of uh, proton pump inhibitor treatment. Uh, down in the antrum, uh, what we may see is a little bit of endocrine cell hyperplasia, as you see here, these uh, increased in these uh, clear cytoplasm uh, cells, which corresponds to uh, staining on uh, um, synaptophysin staining. Other uh, medication-related disorders, of course, uh, include hemorrhagic gastritis, which can be related to NSAIDs, uh, as well as uh, a number of other disorders, a number of other etiologies, but gives you this very diffuse superficially hemorrhagic and early necrotic type of appearance uh, to the uh, uh, mucosa. Now, uh, in a more uh, longer term uh, stage, maybe a subacute pa pattern of injury, uh, we have what's called chemical gastropathy. Uh, and this has a, a very lengthy list of uh, provoking agents. Uh, but the, the big three here would be bile, ethanol and chronic NSAID use. Um, this is characterized by what's been called a corkscrew foveal or hyperplasia, this sort of uh, irregular alternating up and down uh, type of uh, hyperplasia. Notice how expanded the foveolar component is here. Um, in addition, we should expect to begin to see vertical streaks of smooth muscle, uh, and maybe some uh, degree of uh, epithelial atypia indicating the uh, cellular damage that may have occurred on uh, the surface epithelium. Uh, what do we do when we see uh, some of this, but not all? Uh, well, uh, we go to use some of those, uh, cork those uh, waffle words that sometimes around suggestive of or uh, potentially uh, consistent with, uh, those sorts of uh, terms come into play when you maybe you just see foveal or hyperplasia with corkscrew change, but none of this other change. Or when you see a little bit of hyperplasia, lost the corkscrew change, but you have smooth muscle metaplasia. Uh, they, those may be indications that there's been prior damage. Now, uh, iron therapy is uh, employed uh, fairly widely, and this also can produce a uh, gastropathy. Uh, similar to the other gastropathies that we've uh, already mentioned. Uh, but what we might look for here is areas of uh, mineralization. This is kind of the early clue on H&E stain that maybe we should be uh, thinking about uh, iron deposition. And sure enough, using the Prussian blue reaction, uh, an iron stain, you see this very dramatic uh, uh, presence of uh, positive uh, blue material uh, that represents iron. Uh, other uh, mineral uh, disorders uh, would include uh, mucosal calcinosis, uh, which we can encounter uh, here as, as seen uh, in the H&E and here on a PAS uh, in uh, patients with uh, renal failure or other uh, calcium metabolism disorders, parathyroid diseases, for example. In patients who are being treated for cancers, uh, of course, they'll be getting a lot of uh, chemotherapy. And uh, this also can produce glandular damage uh, and uh, provoke a little bit of uh, uh, cytologic atypia to some of these uh, cells as well. Um, radiation damage to the stomach can, can look not terribly uh, dissimilar from this uh, with a, a sort of mild inflammatory change, some regenerative features, some uh, gland dropout, some hyperplasia, uh, all kind of mixed up. So uh, leaving aside the uh, um, pill and chemical-induced uh, lesions, let's talk about some of the more primary inflammatory diseases of the uh, stomach and see if we can shed some light on that uh, hillside. So uh, one of the commonest of these is uh, so-called autoimmune gastritis. And I've put here the low magnification view uh, because this is something that you ought to start to hone in on based on the low magnification view of the biopsy, maybe even before it makes it into your, uh, onto your microscope stage. You should begin to sense that this is a slightly bluer biopsy and that that blueness is more towards the middle or lower portion of the sample than towards the upper portion of the tissue. So with autoimmune gastritis, the immune component, the immune infiltration, the lymphocytic infiltration is within the, and around the parietal uh, uh, mucosa, parietal cells. Uh, it's evidence of uh, parietal cell damage is, is what's going on here with 
the lymphocytes showing you where the where their interests lie. Uh, now, as that uh, progresses, the lymphocytes can become more diffusely involved, and you may see it up near the surface. Um, so if you're biopsying at a late stage, uh, you may see a more difficult to discern. But again, you'll still have this deep component. And this is important because the other very common uh, immune or inflammatory gastropathy is uh, related to a helicobacter, which has a a different pattern of distribution. Uh, with this progressive change, you'll see progressive dropout of the parietal cells. Uh, endocrine cell hyperplasia will ensue and become fairly prominent. Now, related to this would be um, uh, a different sort of lymphocytic inflammation, lymphocytic gastritis, uh, which may be associated with helico helicobacter, but perhaps more commonly with celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and so forth. Uh, our definition here is more than one lymphocyte per four epithelial cell nuclei. So that's kind of the first marker to be thinking of, uh, which tells you that there really can be quite a lot of lymphocytes in the uh, gastric uh, epithelium, but um, that's um, really a threshold to, to be uh, seen. And in fact, in this disorder, usually you have far more than that. And you can see here that there's just way too many nuclei in this surface epithelium. And if we go to higher magnification uh, with a little uh, higher mag view, we can see that, again, there's lots of these clear squiggly cells with slightly cleared cytoplasm. Uh, these are um, lymphocyte nuclei. And so in this uh, section, we, we may almost have uh, four lymphocyte nuclei to one epithelial cell nuclei. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, rarely uh, we will see a so-called <clears throat> collagenous gastritis, uh, somewhat analogous to the collagenous colitis, uh, but without that association. Um, and it also will have some evidence of surface damage um, but with, uh, and, and lymphocytosis within the epithelium, but a thickening of that uh, basal lamina as is typical in the colon. Now, uh, if we're seeing eosinophils instead of lymphocytes, we should begin to think of eosinophilic gastritis, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, uh, because uh, eosinophils in the stomach are quite rare. Um, in the body, they're virtually not seen at all. In the antrum, you can see a couple, but when you start seeing, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 per high power field, uh, you should start thinking about eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Uh, the associations with that uh, are rather protean, uh, it, but it will send the clinician down a very different uh, 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 series of differential diagnostic considerations to identify the cause of that, and of course I'll also the treatment uh, compared to just calling it acute gastritis or some other form of gastritis. Occasionally, we'll see granulomatous uh, gastritis, uh, deep-seated uh, uh, granulomas, sometimes with lymphocytes, sometimes with the little uh, calcified bodies and so forth. Uh, the differential here, of course, is the usual one with the granulomata, uh, infectious, sarcoidosis, foreign body reaction occasionally, uh, and inflammatory bowel disease is the big one, uh, remembering to consider Crohn's disease uh, in the upper gastroenter intestinal tract is a very important thing uh, that can, uh, can cause us a little discomfort if we fail to think about that. Um, there are a, or is a, a more generalized, uh, milder gastritis that can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease that will just give you a little bit of uh, chronic lymphocytic periglandular uh, uh, inflammation. Um, it's very nonspecific. Um, but if you have a patient with known IBD, uh, this sort of a change uh, would correspond to that uh, in some, to some degree. Plasma cytosis without organisms might also be another uh, clue uh, for that uh, diagnosis. Although not specifically an inflammatory disorder, amyloidosis uh, is also seen in the stomach. Uh, here's a very florid case, and you can see at low power how this very pink lamina propria jumps out at you. Um, amyloidosis, of course, is associated with systemic inflammatory conditions uh, or immunoglobulin-producing hem hematolymphoid neoplasms. Uh, 
And we typically will do an Alshin blue, excuse me, a, a Congo red stain, and then polarize the uh, uh, tissue to identify this very characteristic apple green birefringence, uh, whether it's in the stomach or bladder or someplace else. Now, uh, not to be left out, we should uh, mention uh, mast cell disease. Um, although this is not a, strictly an inflammatory disease, this is more of a myeloproliferative or neoplastic disease, uh, but it can involve the stomach um, and produce a, an infiltrative pattern, uh, distorting and displacing the normal glandular component of the, of the, sub -mu of the mucosa. Uh, and again, the epithelium may be relatively spared or with maybe only minimal uh, inflammatory changes. Now, something we see in our uh, practice, because we have a very active uh, bone marrow transplant team, of course, is graft-versus-host disease. Uh, and that can manifest in the skin, in the intestinal tract, and, and so forth. And so the stomach, small bowel, uh, can be fairly frequently sampled when they're thinking of that. The severity can vary quite widely, and the timing is fairly uh, important to understand. This is something that tends to be um, in the first uh, 30 to 60 days uh, following transplant. Um, and so if you start getting out at six months, et cetera, you're unlikely to call it acute graft versus host disease. Uh, the, the finding, of course, is the uh, uh, intraepithelial lymphocytosis and so-called popcorn cells, evidence of gland damage you can see here. Um, but going to high magnification and identifying the lymphocytes and the apoptotic cells and uh, karyorectic bodies uh, is very important. These are not particularly the best uh, photographs of graft versus host disease, so I apologize uh, for that. So let's uh, move on and talk about some of the uh, precursor lesions, the hyperplasias, the metaplasias uh, that can occur and potentially lead us into trouble uh, with uh, neoplastic diseases uh, further on. So uh, one of the uh, uh, more florid of these is Menetrier's disease. Uh, this is typically presents in middle-aged males who have some weight loss, hypoproteinemia, maybe some hypochlorhydria. Um, and this is the gross appearance of this, this very carpeted appearance of just very uh, lots and lots of polypoid projections, uh, which under the microscope have uh, a very florid hyperplastic appearance. Uh, some glandular dilatation, but very benign, banal, foveolar type epithelial cells. So if you're just looking at a biopsy uh, and you haven't seen the gross appearance, uh, you could call this just a uh, hyperplastic polyp um, and uh, say, and next case, please. Uh, but with that gross appearance or the history of a carpet of polyps, uh, we should be uh, suggesting the diagnosis of Menetrier's disease. Now, uh, multifocal atrophic gastritis, I've included here because of its propensity to develop uh, intestinal metaplasia. Um, and thus, this uh, disorder has an increased risk of carcinoma. Uh, in some cases, this may be related to helicobacter. Helicobacter does not thrive in a uh, uh, neutral or basic environment. And so uh, the, the uh, drive or one of the responses to helicobacter infection can be to try to lower, excuse me, to, to uh, raise the pH so that it becomes inhospitable to the helicobacter. Uh, and of course, uh, intestinal type epithelium does that quite well. Uh, but the consequence of that, of course, is that it exposes the patient to risk of uh, developing uh, carcinoma. Now, the difference between this and atrophic chronic gastritis is, or autoimmune gastritis, uh, is the absence of the enterochromophon hyperplasia. Uh, and so looking for that in these uh, parietal cells and looking at, for them in the uh, antral uh, mucosa is important. Uh, another sort of incidentaloma, but uh, that may be confused with metaplasia is uh, xanthelasma. This is uh, actually more frequently an incidental finding, although it does get biopsied sometimes because they see them as yellow spots. Uh, and this can be associated with helicobacter on occasion or more frequently with hypercholesterolemia. Uh, patients who've had uh, prior surgery or maybe uh, other lesions can have this sort of a response as well. 
the key thing here is to not make the diagnosis of signet ring cell carcinoma or diffuse carcinoma. So uh, that's the important differential and to realize that that enters in when you're looking at those uh, lesions where you have this pale uh, infiltrated pattern in the lamina propria. So polyps uh, are uh, where a lot of the action is uh, uh, when you're not looking at inflammatory diseases. And there are several different varieties that we'll just touch on here uh, to sort of wrap up our discussion uh, for today. Uh, the first of these is the fundic gland polyps. Uh, these can be sporadic or uh, syndrome related. Uh, and by, as you might suppose, the name, they occur most typically in the fundus. They look like little glistening uh, pearls sitting on the uh, surface of the mucosa. And uh, at low magnification, they have this uh, very characteristic appearance of uh, glandular dilatation. Uh, sort of look like little sponges there. Um, and this glandular dilatation, whoops, the glandular dilatation uh, can be of varying sizes. Uh, so what's my threshold to call a fundic gland polyp? How many glands do I need to have that are dilated uh, like this? Is one enough or two enough or a grouping enough? Um, well, I think, uh, first of all, um, you, you need to, to recognize why was, a, why was the biopsy done? Were they looking for a polyp? If they're looking for a polyp and you see one, then probably you can call that consistent with a fundic gland polyp. Um, if you, they're not looking at it, they're just biopsying sort of pre-op for, you know, some other kind of surgery, uh, and you see one, well, probably you're just going to gloss over it uh, because there's no real uh, harm in not making the diagnosis and uh, unless they're uh, in a situation where there's syndrome associated, in which case uh, they will already have had probably several. So um, you use sort of a, a bit of judgment there in terms of when you uh, make the diagnosis and when you refrain. Uh, fundic gland polyps can present with dysplasia, and certainly that's a situation where you would not refrain and not mention it. Uh, so here's a, a polyp where we have surface dysplasia, uh, often associated with p53 mutation, and these may be in those patients who have the associated familial adenomatous polyposis. What you don't see here is the glandular dilatation, which was uh, further down uh, in the polyp and in the uh, 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 fundic type uh, glandular tissue. Another lesion that uh, may occasionally be missed or uh, termed a hyperplastic polyp is uh, what's called focal foveal or hyperplasia. Uh, this really is sort of a more diffuse form of, uh, of uh, hyperplastic polyp. You can see, however, how, that here it extends over a very broad zone uh, here in a, a partial gastrectomy for other purposes, for other reasons. Uh, it's maybe less polypoid um, on your slide than maybe it is uh, under the endo endoscope. Uh, however, the good news is, is that there are no bad outcomes with this. Um, and so that's always a favorable uh, finding. Hyperplastic polyps uh, or regenerative polyps sometimes, uh, um, as we've alluded to, have a foveolar hyperplastic component. Um, but they may also have a very edematous uh, uh, stroma and then slightly inflamed stroma. They may have some deep glandular dilatation with a partial gland rupture, although these will usually be foveolar type glands, not fundic glands that will be dilated. Um, often these polyps grossly have a rather broad stalk um, and these foveolar pits uh, can be quite uh, hyperplastic and dilated. And that's what gives you the deep glandular dilatation. So how do hyperplastic polyps figure with malignancy? Well, there is a, a small, but not a zero uh, malignant potential in and of themselves. Um, however, um, the, the finding of the coexistence of hyperplastic polyps in stomachs that do have malignancy is uh, certainly far greater than would be expected, 20% uh, in normal. And that may be uh, that that is because uh, they, this, these tend to form when you have uh, either atrophy or some sort of inflammatory change, and that may also be associated with malignancy. So this is sort of a, uh, uh, a uh, concomitant development, not a de, de novo or important uh, first step on the pathway to malignancy. 
However, should you see a flat polyp with low-grade dysplasia, uh, that may be an adverse marker for uh, a development of uh, subsequent or concurrent carcinoma. So it bears watching, and this is an important polyp type to make the diagnosis. Now, something that's seen fairly infrequently in our practice is the Cronkite Canada polyps. Uh, these uh, closely resemble hyperplastic polyps in the stomach, and so lacking a uh, particular diagnosis or history, uh, you're kind of up a creek to make the diagnosis um, other than maybe to call it a polyp. Uh, and so it's rare as a pathologist to make the diagnosis of Cronkite Canada syndrome, uh, certainly not on the basis of the morphology. Putz Jaeger's polyps, in contrast, uh, however, are something that you can uh, recognize. Uh, Putz Jaeger's polyps uh, have uh, arborizing uh, smooth muscle cores. And uh, so seeing these branching uh, central core of smooth muscle with the mucosa that is characteristic of the location in the body uh, should give you enough of a clue to say this is probably a Putz Jaeger's type polyp. Uh, and as you know, putz jaeger syndrome has uh, several other associations, and uh, we've made uh, some other videos on uh, that topic as well. Juvenile polyposis uh, sometimes is uh, confused with uh, putz jaegers polyps, but this is, uh, has a different germline mutation in SMAD4 and uh, BMPR1A. Uh, these uh, patients who have the SMAD4 mutations do have a uh, significant risk of gastric polyposis and cancers. Um, and so that is uh, something to take note of. Uh, inflammatory fibroid polyp uh, is uh, uh, nicely described. Uh, it's got a lot of inflammation um, and it has a somewhat fibroid or myofibroblastic type appearance. It really can occur anywhere in the GI tract, but it's most commonly seen in the stomach. Uh, usually in sort of the prepyloric area, uh, it's uh, usually considered non-neoplastic, although with uh, some of the more advanced uh, molecular techniques, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we were to detect some sort of a molecular abnormality there. Uh, often these have a very eosinophilic rich uh, inflammatory component, um, and usually that's occurring in older adults. Uh, the key differential, of course, is to rule out GIST um, or other mesenchymal neoplasm, but GIST is certainly the most uh, commonly encountered uh, gastric uh, uh, stromal neoplasm. Well, uh, that leaves us with uh, some of the infectious diseases to talk about. Um, so save the best for last. Pelicobacter pylori is such a wonderful story. Uh, certainly it, it accounts for many, many gastric ulcers and has a significant relationship to both gastric carcinoma and uh, malt lymphomas. And this is uh, such a remarkable uh, story in medical history uh, that it almost merits its own uh, uh, story, which uh, maybe we'll do later. Uh, but suffice it to say that uh, a little bit of uh, pathologic inquiry and uh, self-experimentation uh, reliably uh, proved that this organism was responsible for the gastritis. Um, and Amazingly, this is uh, almost now a diagnosis that in many instances you can make at low power based on the distribution. So note here that the lymphocytes, the, the blue part here is on the surface. It's not down here in the, in the uh, you know, gastric body or in the uh, antral type glands at all. It's mostly here on the superficial portion. Uh, and then we can go to higher magnification to uh, make the confirmatory finding. However, there are a couple of other clues that can uh, lead us there, uh, even before we've seen the organisms. One is if we identify germinal centers, virtually a dead ringer for helicobacter uh, gastritis. Um, additionally, seeing these clustered neutrophils, little clear spaces uh, in the uh, foveolar pits uh, is very characteristic of helicobacter gastritis. Um, the, the organisms live in the mu mucus, uh, they don't like the acid, they tend to, to live, excuse me, they like the acid, but they tend to stay in the mucus uh, where they can control their environment a little bit more uh, easily. Now, uh, in most laboratories, uh, you can identify the organisms on H&E stain, um, but when you don't, it raises the question of when do we do a stain? Uh, 
Um, our laboratory is not like many, which uh, do, do uh, these stains right up front on every gastric biopsy, uh, but we do comment on the presence or absence of Helicobacter in virtually every gastric uh, biopsy. Um, but uh, we use basically two rules. Um, if it looks inflammatory wise, like it ought to be Helicobacter, but we're not seeing organisms, then, uh, or if the patient has been treated or has a history of Helicobacter, then we would usually stain to make sure. Uh, certainly high, organ, uh, high to organism burdens like this, you're not gonna have too much trouble finding that on uh, either a uh, right geme sustain, Difquick stain, or an immunohistochemical stain for Helicobacter. But the rare microorganisms, the occasional single organism here and there in the gland that you wanna be sure is, uh, we prefer the immunohistochemical stain to provide reliable uh, identification and exclusion of other uh, possibilities. So uh, Helicobacter is an important precursor lesion and uh, Maltoma is one of the significant uh, consequences of this, uh, this uh, infection over the long term. And it usually requires a long-standing history. Uh, we think of uh, Maltoma when we begin to see expansion of the interglandular spaces. So if we just see um, you know, superficial inflammation, uh, then you know, we don't think about Maltoma. But when it starts to spread deeper, when it starts to separate the glands, and when we start to see lymphoepithelial lesions, which you can see right here, uh, which are lymphocytes within the epithelial compartment of the stomach, uh, and when you start to see glands that have dropped out, you should be thinking maltoma. Now, what can look like uh, helicobacter? Well, it has a few uh, cousins on the uh, phylogenetic tree, uh, one of which is uh, helicobacter halmanii. Uh, this can produce similar symptoms. It has uh, less inflammation, as you can see here. It's not very striking. It doesn't have as high a risk of cancer, and it's much harder to find, and, and it even may coexist and cross-react. Uh, but uh, they tend to be a little bit longer and they tend to float more freely uh, in the uh, mucus. So um, here's an example. Helicobacter pylori tend to attach to the surface of the epithelial cells, as you can see here, they're sort of attached. Whereas these longer Helicobacter halmanii have a sort of beaded appearance, and this is with a, a Steiner stain. Uh, you can see the beading uh, more characteristically here, uh, and they tend to float free in the mucin rather than to have a surface epithelial connection. Although, quite frankly, in a tissue section, that can be a challenge to identify. Now, another infectious uh, e uh, entity that also can have uh, lymphoma association is uh, Epstein-Barr gastritis. Uh, and this actually can uh, mimic diffuse large B cell lymphoma, much as it does in the tonsil or other areas of the body. Uh, you get this very marked uh, uh, lymphoblastic response here that looks uh, for all the world like a potential malignancy. Um, and so being aware of that possibility uh, in the right uh, demographic group, um, age-wise and so forth, and uh, potentially the history-wise, um, in a patient who's had a sort of semi-acute illness, uh, a little bit of fever and so forth, uh, you can think about that. So let's go on and talk about the actual dysplasias that uh, can occur in adenomas. We've talked about hyperplastic polyps and they rarely get dysplasia, uh, but some other types of uh, polyps, more typical adenomatous polyps can occur. Uh, there are principally two types of dysplasia uh, and essentially we're looking again at two grades. So the most common type is intestinal type dysplasia, uh, and that can occur, of course, in the setting of um, <clears throat> atrophic chronic gastritis or intestinal metaplasias and so forth that you can get an uh, adenomatous change and uh, low-grade uh, dysplasia. Uh, you can see occasional PANF cells, as you can see here uh, in these uh, lesions. And you're beginning to get a little bit more complex architecture, so you may wonder, uh, is this moving up to become a high-grade uh, dysplasia? Uh, but essentially that uh, centers around whether or not we're still seeing some degree of uh, cellular organization. So if we're still seeing basal nuclei or stratification and cigar-shaped nuclei, uh, we would stay with low-grade dysplasia. Uh, 
However, when it starts to become more complex architecturally, when the cells start to round up, um, uh, get a little bit more coarse chromatin, we might move on to high-grade dysplasia. Fovelar type dysplasia uh, is a slightly different animal, um, maybe a little bit more subtle to uh, identify uh, because it looks very much like these foveolar cells and they have some uh, basal orientation. But here notice that we're starting to see a little bit of uh, nuclear heterogeneity, so a few macronuclei, um, maybe a little bit of crowding. Uh, these uh, tend to be MUC5AC positive uh, if you're interested in doing immunohistochemistry. Uh, but uh, I think you can see here that this is um, a foveolar adenoma uh, with foveolar type dysplasia. Uh, another adenoma that uh, does not have quite the same uh, malignant risk is a pyloric gland adenoma. Uh, here it's seeing a fairly typical type of pyloric glands. Um, but as you see a little bit of atypia, this would be MUC6 positive. Um, and uh, typically uh, occurs uh, in the uh, prepyloric area. Well, uh, that uh, I think is enough to cover for today. I hope that's brought a few things into focus. Thanks for joining me. I hope that uh, if you like this, you'll subscribe and uh, share it with others and look for us to, to come back again with some more insights into GI and GYN pathology uh, as it affects uh, um, the uh, practice of surgical pathology and our training uh, for new pathologists.